it's, 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 it's actually fantastic that so many people showed up. It's fantastic that uh, so many people showed up so early. And uh, I, I look forward to the next, uh, the next period. Yeah. I'm not... I'm not that familiar with the uh, web, but uh, you don't need to. Yeah, I will be. Yeah, be hey, seems to be. Ah, uh, how do I? We're getting. Okay, uh, let me see. All You muted everybody again. Sorry, Benny again, and I had Well, I, I really hope that uh, this connection is going to work somewhat better. I, I still have muted most everyone. Um, yeah. So, thank you, Vera, Gerard. Let's let's get going, and and uh, please do use the chat. I did. Uh, yeah, I just ended up muting everybody. And I suspect we may have other issues with the connection through the 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 the, uh, the web uh, session is uh, is for about a, you know we have room for about 150 people and we're literally at 126 so we're closing into the place where I hope it's not uh, I hope it's not uh, too critical so. Sh thanks everyone for coming in. My name is Dennis Lambert. I'm w I'm with Redline. Uh, I take it you see my screen. So we'll go. I'll I'll just assume every. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. Thanks. Actually, I like the feedback. So uh, first off, thank you very much to the folks at ISP Supplies to setting up. Uh, thank you for such a huge crowd. Uh, we'll try to bring you as much value as possible. Sorry for the delay for those who've been on the call since uh, gee, 20 to the hours. Um, oh, with uh, with me on the call, there's obviously the folks from ISP Supplies. There's also Anna Webb from Nominet, the database, and she will give us a live uh, presentation of the database. I'll we'll switch presenter uh, in, in a few moments. But uh, the what the point of today's conversation is really to to try to demystify a lot about TV white space, demystifying what's taking place and what are the different process and in the process. Of doing this, we'll also do some conversation around the products. Uh, you can imagine that we make radio, so yes, I will plug our radios at some point. Uh, we are uh, Redline is an uh, an IS Net World certified organization. What that implies is that uh, we are very keen about. Uh, let me see. We're very keen about. Uh, safety on the job site and uh, uh let me just get rid of the toolbar here let me get rid of all of it actually there you go so we're very keen about uh, safety on the job sites the uh so the first two slides are all about hsse health safety and environment um if you're driving please pull on the side of the road 
uh, the call is recorded, so uh, you could just ask the folks at, uh, at ISP Supplies and they'll get the recording. Uh, if people have objection to the record to, to us recording the call and eventually the conversation, uh, please uh, just send your question by text so it's not going to show up. Um, be careful. Know the emergency safety place. Don't drink and drive and do everything else that your mama told you to do when you were a young man and everything will be just fine. The agenda for today is, is as I've mentioned, talking about white TV white space and everybody's heard about TV white space for a while now. And, and why is it that all of a sudden it seems to be critical? It seems to be happening. So we're going to talk about that. Some of the basic FCC rules, some of the database fundamentals and, and Anna from, uh, Nominet is going to give us a, a ride, literally a virtual uh, on, on the database. And then we're going to address some of the facts, basic best practice, some of the products. And uh, we're going to close with, uh, with ISP supplies. The intent is to make all of this, um, me talk, me and Anna talking about a half an hour. Uh, so we have plenty of time for all kinds of questions thereafter. Uh, because we, we realize that we're not going to be able to answer just everything through a presentation. So without any further ado, let's jump into this thing. Skip that. We'll save time. We, I've just talked about that. So the TV, why TV white space matter is really, uh, or why is it so visible these days is really about a couple of very compelling events. Uh, it's about Microsoft and Redline partnership that took place. And, and I've got one slides on this, but, but it's all about making this affordable. There's definitely a resurgence of, of, uh, rural access to funding and, and a change in the funding structure at the same time. So in North America, like most of the world is very rural space if you take away probably 20 or 30 big city the rest of the u.s is still very much countryside and in countryside you need non-line of sight it's it's not an issue if uh if the fcc would have said hey we'll give the 900 ism band an extra 75 meg and we would have a hundred you know 100 meg of 900 to play with none of us would be here having this conversation uh, can you hear me i saw uh, Mr. Uh, Craig, you, you mentioned you have, uh, you're not hearing me. Can anybody just quickly chat to say, okay, perfect. Thanks, Greg. So, the, uh, the, uh, yeah, so we need you. non line of sight in, in, uh, in rural North America as well as anywhere in the world. Uh, the reality is if in 2019, if somebody's not connected today, well, it's just going to happen. It, simply, it's not going to happen by itself. So you need sub one gig band to do non line of sight. And right now in the US and most of the world, I got to say, TV white space is the only sub gig band that's got enough spectrum for anyone to build a, a, a proper network. So this is actually the, a key factor. It's not about the technology in the band. It's not about red line or anybody else. It's about the fact that there is available spectrum. And that's, you know, available meaning you don't have to pay through your nose and it's, you know, it's license exempt because that's the key thing. There is a database, but the spectrum is license exempt. The big driver uh, for uh, for the big rural part actually is you've seen these uh, time and again. Uh, most of you are ISPs operating in the rural space. So, you know, as much as I that. It's not just about uh, getting connection. It's also the, the transformation of society and, trans and, and the p connection landscape brings education, health, ability for people to stay outside of the big center, ability for people who stay outside of the big center to have the same experience or similar experience, to have the same shot at education, at employment. Uh, if you're thinking about the guys in agriculture, they need that connectivity. And we're seeing everybody's talking about IoT. Well, IoT is not a is not restricted to downtown Manhattan. IoT is for everybody, from farmers to ranchers to to uh, rural kind of communities. The big difference in the funding part is that lately, and we've seen this with CAF. Uh, lately, they are expecting coverage. They are expecting full coverage, uh, and that is the big big transformational part. Uh, funding for the longest time has been like a, a percentage base and it was okay. So it was always the same people getting an extra, extra capacity for the middle mile. 
but those who were not connected remain unconnected. So more need, since everybody needs to be connected in the census part from the CAF and from others organization funding people, that drives further requirement to, to for the online of site, trying to push SAT service uh, further out the, the, the chain. Uh, you've all heard about Microsoft, and I did mention that it is a key factor into this. Um, the Microsoft uh, objective, and, and I'm not Microsoft, this is my take on it. Microsoft's objective is to create a momentum, is to be a change agent. And they're doing this through a number of ways that, that doesn't necessarily ties to money, but that creates financial advantage. So their objective clearly is the first bullet is, is very nice. Get new fixed broadband users. Their, their, their original plan was to get 2 million new connection. They wanted to, they have changed it to make it three because they've been successful in, in signing agreement with, uh, with airband commercial partners. But more importantly, what they're doing to facilitate this for you, me, and everybody else is a lot of political influence with regulator. They're building up a very, very strong lobby. Uh, they're building up the uh, Connected American site. They are pushing regulator. And if you look at the airband leadership, they are all former FCC uh, person. So they know how to talk the same language. They are putting a lot of uh, support in the education of what connectivity can do at, at all political level. And they are driving a lot of the demand creation. Their objective is very simple. They want to sell more cloud services. So that it's not just a social impact. Because of the social impact, we see a lot of the philanthropy around uh, the Airbed project. But it, at the end, they need more people connected, more device, more people. The commercially, what that translates to is a unique CapEx. Oops, sorry, I should have clicked my mouse. The unique CapEx structure worldwide for the products uh, for the Airbed member. The OPEX component, in order to have a unique Price worldwide with uh, with different regulations, FCC, HETC, different database operations, different everything. Uh, we need to be able to have to, to to control the price structure. So it's done by a, a fixed capex anywhere in the world and a per country opex component. So everybody gets the same base price and then it can just fluctuate instead of having a price structure uh, per country. This is a Microsoft. This is a Microsoft uh, requirement. It's it's not uh, anybody else. It, it Microsoft wants a single price worldwide. And uh, guys, I've been I've been doing web sessions for 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 this or for other things for a while, but I keep getting a blink on my screen that we have filled 151 seats. So thank you all for being here. I think I'll take a screenshot of this one. And we're actually start turning down customers uh, for this. So that's that. Sorry for them. Uh, yeah, thank you. So you'll talk, we'll see, uh, you can talk to the guys at ISP supplies to understand what that CapEx price, if you've not done this already. Um, and I'll skip that. The FCC rule, and, and you're going to see something important here. FCC has changed the rule a couple of years ago to, to, uh, the TV white space. It allows more power. It allows this and that, but it also introduced something called the uh, the spectrum density or the power spectrum density and that that has never been done before and that's this is where it gets a bit tricky so when somebody says how much power can you use well you have an idea here different ERP allowed depending on different noise level and channel availability and it goes further because depending on how high you are off the ground your base station and depending on how far you are from a from a broadcast station, your actual power is limited. So you can go for down to, to 40 milliwatt or up to four watt, depending on how far away you are from broadcast. So there's a lot of calculation involved into the day. So whenever somebody says, well, how much power can I use? It's a trick question because it can be anywhere from 16 dB to 36 dB of total ERP based on who you are, where you are, how high you are. Luckily, uh, the database does most of those calculations for you, and Anna is going to demonstrate this. What you do need to remember is that the power, you know, the, the power is not the same for everything everywhere, and antennas can be mounted no higher than 30 meter at ground level, 100 feet. 
and then it cannot go above 250 meter above average terrain. What that means is that we, if if you're in a, if you're in Colorado at the bottom of the of the mountains, and you say, well, gee, I can load up on the mountain and get lots of visibility. Be be aware that you may actually go beyond the 250 meter, and you may have to dig a hole to plant your tower. So it, it, it's getting on the highest spot may actually is is uh, tricky we have seen deployment where people are allowed no more than 15 feet for the tower because the location chosen ended up being higher than the average terrain so it's it's it, there's a lot of things to take care of and to see but again luckily anna's got answers for all of us so and and uh, right on this one i will switch over to anna if i can find her name first let me unmute her Anna, you should be able to talk right now. Anna? Can you hear me, Anna? Okay. Anna, are you still there? I see you, but I think your connectivity issue, maybe. Okay, so listen. Uh, hello, Anna. No, we cannot hear you, Anna. L yeah, could you, you have you looked if you've muted yourself? That yeah, you may try to IP voice because we're at actually we're at session maximum and looks like IP voice still works, but normal voice has a bit of an issue. Sorry, folks, for the uh, wee bit of a delay. Anna, hi, Denise. I can hear you now. You can hear me. Very weakly, but we do. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. You will. Good apologies for that. I'm, with, uh, with, uh, I'm on my. Uh, I'm calling from my laptop, so um, hopefully it's okay. Like that. okay. And that's the. There you go. And that's the, there you go. So thank you, Denis, for um, for the introduction, and thank you all for joining. Yeah, I think, as Denis said, it's great to see there's so many people uh, people on the line. So hopefully, you can answer all the questions that you have uh, on TV Whitespace. So just as a bit of an introduction, I am um, I look after the business development side for uh, Phenomenet and the work that we're doing with regards to dynamic spectrum management, um, and TV Whitespace uh, falls into that. The role of Nominet within TV Whitespace is, is the database. And the role of the database is really there to protect the incumbents and make sure that the equipment being used knows what channels are available to make sure that the incumbents are still protected. Uh, so as Denis mentioned, using TV Whitespace, the incumbent users are the TV broadcasters. Um, and using the Whitespace in between that is the spectrum that the broadcasters are not using. So the role that we need to play is key in that, and we have to make sure that the data we have from the likes of the FCC is up to date, uh, so we know where all the broadcasters are and all of the channels they are using. Um, and we also need to make sure there's any other protected entities can register on our database and make sure that's communicated then to the equipment. Uh, so the best way really of demonstrating this is the platform that, that you can see that I'm sharing on the screen at the moment. So as well as the actual database, uh, which is a cloud solution that we have, we've also developed a number of tools to uh, really support demonstrating how TV Whitespace works, but also supports in the planning to check what channels are available and kind of do any pre-searches pre and help to support your, uh, what your network build may look like. Uh, so this is our WaveDB platform, WaveDB Explorer, and 
it is something that is um, accessible, you can subscribe to. Uh, we're launching a new version at the end of the month, so this is the, uh, the first time I'm actually showing it to, uh, to anyone. So any feedback you have at the end uh, will certainly be appreciated. So let me just log in. When you log into the tool, there is a brief tutorial, but I will uh, skip through that because I will show you, uh, show you how to use it. So as I zoom in on the map, you'll see that there's a number of icons start appearing, and these are all of the TV towers. So this is, this is up-to-date data that we take from the FCC, and we map out across the whole of the United States all of the, uh, the TV towers. Can you hear me? I can hear, I can read that some people cannot hear me. I can hear you fine. I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, good. So all of these map out the TV towers and all the locations they are. If you select them, you can see um, the channels that they are on. So for example, this particular tower is using channel 17. Uh, this particular tower has a number of channels uh, and you can also look at the contours and how, um, how that uh, tower is transmitting. And that's important as you start to build out your network. If you actually have an idea as to where maybe you want to check um, what channel availability is and if TV white space is something that you could use, you can take a base station and either through typing in the address or just through typing in uh, the last along or just finding the location, you can simply place the base station marker and you will get a graph along the bottom here, which gives you an indication of all of the channels uh, you want to see blue. So this, for example, channel 16 here. If I select this, this shows the maximum ERP power on channel 16 that I could transmit if my base station was at this particular location. Um, it, the, the tool indicates uh, VHF, UHF, and anything above channel 39 is uh, in the 600 megahertz band. Uh, so we are also working with T-Mobile to make sure that all of the data on their planned deployments is within this tool. Um, so anything, any location that, that you are mapping out across the US will have uh, all of that data uh, input into it. Uh, once you've got a base station, you can then also start to map out what um, your network may look like. So if you've got a, a client device, you can say, well, I want to put my client device here. Once you get the black solid line, um, you get a link. Um, and also we've got the terrain profile. This is quite uh, key when you're looking at your TV white space network, just making sure terrain, it helps uh, with some, maybe some of the pre-planning um, and in terms of the uh, due diligence that you might do when, uh, when you're working with Redline in terms of doing what your, uh, your network design might look like. Now, you can also add multiple client devices um, if required as well, just to start, uh, start building this out. Yeah, within the settings bar, you can change the height. So with the AGL to see again how that may change. So I'll just show you example here. If I change the height of the base station, you'll see how the power limits change um, along the uh, along the graph, but also how the spread um, of the signal um, goes. And this is also live data. So if I was to place a base station here, you can see as I move the location of the base station, how the power limit changes. Um, across wherever it is. So it's, it's live data based on that particular location. And a new feature that we have just added is um, we've, we've added some data overlays um, into this. So if I go on to this icon here, which says show market data, I can click on this. And basically what we've done, we've done an overlay of the, um, of the population initially. Um, so you can see we've done it. Um, it's quite fine grain the details. Um, so at the moment, this is just statewide, but you can see just some details by hovering over. Um, we can also then start to break down based on population, what population um, has in, in a particular area, um, over 100 meg or 25 or 10. So for example, I just go on to 25 here. We can start to look at certain areas where it may be, um, if, if for example, you're a wireless ISP, um, it may be worth looking at areas may, where you want to expand your network or see if there is uh, an area that, that is struggling with connectivity and where TV white space might be able to be used. So this area here, we can see as we zoom in, the green area is where they've got 
quite good connectivity already. So they have over 300 meg. We've also got indications of the median income. So what it allows you to do is go, well, look, the area around Hutchinson has got uh, good connectivity. This is maybe an area that I could um, put my base station. So it's connected to some backhaul. Uh, and then I can connect an area with a client device using TV white space. And it gives you an idea as to the population that you can connect with that TV white space. So for example, this, this area here, we can see on the population that um, maybe there's a thousand people that, are, that, that could be connected using, using TV white space. And it gives you an idea so you can, you can build uh, potentially a, a pipeline and, and help you build out your network and, and see what, um, what communities and the number of population you may be able to, to support with that network. Uh, so that's a new feature we've just recently added um, or be on the release uh, coming at the end of the month. But this tool really is here to support and facilitate uh, any of the pre-planning. So we, we work closely with Redline on this, and, and I know the guys there use it. But it is also something that uh, will be available via a subscription service um, if it's something you want to use in, in, in your pre-planning as well. So, Denise, from my side, I don't think there's much to cover. I can see there's maybe a few questions um, that have come up. Yeah, and you may want to take the time to take the time for another question. Let me just read through, um, read through these. Um, so to gain access to the tool, I think someone might have sent a URL. There will be a subscription um, service that is coming in. Um, so we'll be able to share details. If you have any um, requests on any uh, information that you want, I can always carry out the channel availability checks uh, through access that I have. Um, but there is, um, there is some details that will be shared at the end of the month, how to access how to subscribe um, to the service. And you will be at West America. Yes, we will be there. So we can, um, I will be there with uh, a number of my colleagues. So we can, we can have any discussions there or, or set access up um, as well. Um, 5G mapping at the moment, this is just a tool used for TV white space. Um, we will be looking to incorporate other, um, other technologies into it. We're, we're looking uh, um, uh, getting involved in CBRS as well, so it may be something that, that we incorporate into the same uh, channel availability tool. But uh, but at the moment, this is this is just focused on uh, on TV white space. Um, so existing TV white space deployments are, um, or at least the icons, because a, a TV white space. Deployment um, is a protected entity. There are um, a number of them showing um, certain locations. So I can show you in here if I can remember where they are. Uh, you'll see there is a little white icon um, that comes up. So any protected entity will be shown in, and I can't um, see where they are now, but it, but it's a number of the TV white space deployments are shown there. Um, so you can see, but all of that data isn't always inputted from a protection and um, perspective. We don't put all of that data um, into into it. A lot of it is just based on the TV, to uh, the TV towers and also other protected entities. You can see some of these here. This is um, protected entities. The data is, is inputted into our, into our database. So I think that's all of the questions from my side. If you have any more, please just write them in, and I, I will be on the line um, for the rest of the, uh, the rest of the time. So if there's any more questions that come up um, afterwards, please uh, please just let me know. Thank you, Denny. No worries. Let me just uh, switch the screen. Oh, no, we are here. Let me see. You're right. Uh, there are some deployment in uh, Western Maryland. So there we go. So sorry for the, the delay in switching screen. Thank you so much, uh, Anna. And uh, guys, yes, please uh, s keep sending your question. And, and uh, now that Anna is, is not necessarily talking, um, She'll be able to start answering questions that you would have for her on the chat. 
uh, and that is all recorded for uh, so you'll have access to review all of these. Um, now, the database does a fantastic job. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And those of you who've been uh, in the TV white space before, if you go back to the Spectrum Bridge days and others, this is light years ahead. There's no doubt that it's going to be a one, probably one of the very good reason why it's, TV white space will be more successful now than ever before. How that plays from a radio perspective um, once you get to the radio, so you do the work, you do your desktop work through database to see, and, and we're also, this is where we start talking possibly about best practice. You're talking about non line of sight. You're talking about a, a, a database engine that's going to give you availability of, ch of channel as well as power that you're allowed to and, and other information. So once you do that part of the work first, the same as if you do for any other band, and then you identify the, the channels that you could uh, use and, and or the prefer preferable channel uh, in terms of getting more power or bonding channels. And then when you get to the radio configuration, it's the same thing as any unlicensed platform. Uh, the other, I'm sorry, I'm mumbling this one. It's the same as any other unlicensed band with the twist that you have one more screen. And that screen is where you pick the channel. So You've already then run a spectrum sweep, uh, as you would probably do for any other band, to find out what are the least noisy areas. And uh, you need, and then you get to the TV white screen page and and click on the channels that you want. And the, all those are those in red are are closed. Those are in black are busy, and and twenty is just. Uh, the one that was selected in this screenshot. So it's, it's not a special code or anything. So that's really what it is. In, in terms of a radio configuration, you just do the same thing. Check your, uh, check the spectrum's availability, run a spectrum sweep to find out where, what is best for you to use, go to the TV channel place and, and try to match it. So no other, it's, it's no more complicated. We have, there, we could probably spend two hours talking about best practice. So I'll just take, uh, given the time it is, I just, I'll just breeze through a few things, but I do want to point out that everything, I think everything that, uh, that we're going to say and far more is, uh, is represented and ISP supply has it. Any issues with it? And, uh, has it on their website. So we've, we've crafted uh, about a 20 page best practice. Uh, we spent the last four years playing with TV white space out in the field and, and we've had a number of failure and we have a number of success. And the summary of this is actually in this guide that you can download from uh, the ISP supplies, uh, uh, blog, I believe that you can download from Redline. Uh, it's, and, and if you, uh, if you are an ISP Airbed member and you click on the connect Redline, it's there as well. So we've tried to, if you send an email to Redline, you're probably going to receive it automatically. We're trying to make sure everybody gets it. It talks about the rules, but it also talks about, oh, there you go. It also talks about the, the, how, how to deal with it. And fundamentally, it's non line of sight. So all questions around, um, capacity, speed, performance is individual shot. I mean, there's brochures talk about, performance in a perfect day in northern Dakota where it's all flat with no trees but uh, that's not reality reality is you're going to run this thing in non line of sight you will have obstruction you need to find out in your neighborhood in your geography what is the best way to operate and in quite often the best way to operate is dealing with obstruction rather than noise one of the key factors to the band is the fact that you're going to be dealing with potential noise far greater than you've ever seen because the TV broadcast industry, they're not operating at, at 36 dB. They're operating at a, last, uh, a low power TV goes up to 25,000 watts. If you get a real big broadcaster, it will go to 70,000 watts. And they're going to be 800, 900 feet off the ground. So they will, they will pollute the air for us in a very wide area. So that being said, 
quite often. That's one, possibly one of the reasons why they actually were able to put a cap in terms of elevation, because if you put a TV white space radio 500 feet off the ground, you're not going to be able to do anything. There's no way your, your 20 dB of TX power or 22 dB of TX power is going to fight off, you know, 70,000 watt. It's just not going to happen. So you need to, to understand how to deal with the noise level. What is the noise level in your geography? And, uh, and find alternative. The good, the good news about the noise is it's quite static. There's not too many new TV stations. The band propagates extremely well. But it also is a bit of a challenge if you need to co-locate a bunch of radios together because uh, propagating extremely well also means that co-location is difficult. So uh, as a for instance, if you do the mats, you're going to find out that uh, on, on 600 megahertz, if you have about 10 feet of separation, you should be able to do reuse of one. Uh, challenge is you'll never got to have, you're not going to find an antenna that's, that's got enough rejection to allow you for doing this. So you, just like anything else in non-line of sight, you need to validate shot by shot and you need to build your own intuition about it. But at the same time, the guide will provide you with the, with the very, the most common frequently asked question. Have a look at it. It's going to probably answer a number of things. And we also have, uh, and I believe that's also on the ISP Supplies website, we have a full test plan that we've developed over the years down to, to, to the configuration, down to the IP, and you can also download the config files because when you get a radio that you've not played with before, nobody's expecting you to be an expert overnight. So to simplify life, uh, we have online training videos that you can find it's free it's on our website. You just go there and there's, you know, basic UHF overview operation, basic link budgeting, basic point to point, basic multi point video uh, telling you exactly how to configure. The test plan is, is downloadable as well as the config file. So we're trying to make it extremely simple uh, for you to, to deal with the fact that there's two new factor in this wireless space, a database. That means you just can't decide where you're going to go. You have to select specifically. And the fact that you're going to deal with potential noise that's far greater than, than uh, you've seen before and how to deal with it. We've got customers that are getting better capacity at ground level dealing with trees rather than going up, getting higher modulation, but getting hit with a, with a noise level that's too high. So, uh, We'll entertain any question. The guide is, you should download the guide if you don't have it already. Uh, but keep in mind, it's not line of sight. Every shot is different. It's no different than 900. You need to, 30 years ago, you started with 900 and you learned how it works, how it behaved for you. The same applies here. You'll have to do this again. Uh, there's nothing beats the database will provide you with very solid guidance. Uh, sadly, uh, nobody ever traveled the whole country to run spectrum analyzer. So you, you, you there might be there might be areas where you're going to see difference. The uh, I'm, I'm going to go through and we're almost done. We're going to go to the question soon. Just want to one plug on Redline. So Redline has basically two offers, three offers to the market. Uh, our UHF product comes from the virtual fiber family. Uh, that it's a platform that we do in in UHF, of course, two, three, and five gig. It's always the same. This is probably where Redline's a bit different. Uh, we came at it from the broadband, and we have a software-defined radio, and we had to do a UHF for uh, offshore militaries. And uh, when when the band became popular from a service provider, we just kind of repackaged it to so it doesn't have to be mil spec and, and somewhat less expensive because if anybody would have looked at our red line radios a couple years ago for uhf the uh i, I know the comments that we would have was the cp was two thousand dollar and yeah that was a mil spec pcp that was not intended for residential so this didn't the drive uh puerto rico is part of the u.s so i would suspect uh, the, the same rules apply to the uh the other part of red line so this is fixed nomadic solutions for enterprise, for, for uh, our conventional markets. Our, our long lasting market has been in energy, oil and gas, mining, uh, state locals, offshore applications. So we're, we're known for very robust platform. The enterprise uh, that ISP supplies will be proposing to you 
is the same RF part. We've just, I don't want to say unruggedized it because that sounds pejorative, but we've removed some of the, the power protection, the brownout that's required in, in, in those bad plates. Um, that the other part of Redline is LTE. Um, we have two platform for LTE, fully ours, uh, fully 3GPP. So if we're, we're playing with band 12, 17, 18, 14, 27, 28, uh, we also have a CDRS uh, band 42 solution. That's, uh, well, that should be fully certified by now as soon as the FCC resumes operation. Uh, so we're going to be in time for, for deployment. It's been being tested in a number of areas so far. And, and it is a full 3GPP, fully mobile. So in the, uh, in the red line space, let me switch screen. In the red line space, you can actually have RE node B, which actually is, uh, so it's a, again, full 3GPP, but it's scaled down in terms of, uh, sizing for real people. Uh, so it's not meant to light up Manhattan. Sorry, I was reading some questions at the same time. It's not meant to read up to light up Manhattan, but it's meant to light up rural communities, private networks. Uh, we've done a lot with First Nation uh, in different uh, parts of North America uh, because you know no but no carriers will go to a community of 500, but this can actually is size to go. This is all it is. It's 20 pounds all outdoor. Being standard based, that means you could use our radio and somebody else's UE in the LT space. You could use our EPC, our full core, or you could use somebody else's core, or you could use our core with somebody else's radio. Uh, so that's the beauty of 3GPP. The commercial products in UHF are here. These are the platform. And uh, the same products exist here, same RF feature, but more rugged, more uh, robust, more ruggedized, either FIPS 140.2 certified or ATEX zone one, zone two, so for different militaries. Uh, so we, in, in I'll, I won't go through the slide, uh, it's part of the deck. Whatever the band in the uh, RDL 3000 platform, the features are the same. But if we, when we introduced QAM 256 for five gig, UHF got it too. When we introduced very solid MIMO A4 UHF, uh, five gig guided to. So all of this I'll skip. It talks about different things. Um, we also have a full service offer, uh, to, to complement. Actually, this is the keyword to complement our partners and our customers services. Our job is, you know, we're not geared to be an engineering firm, but we have done full RF design and network design and commissioning to support our people. So that's never our choice, but if when we have to step it up, we can do it. If uh, who from uh, from ISP supplies, we're done and we're about, uh, we're about to go to a question period. So who from ISP supplies would want to have the mic to put uh, the final word? Hmm. No one, hmm, that's interesting. Blake, you're unmuted. Oh, Jonathan, let me let me unmute you. Sorry, let me do that. It's a little longer to scroll through the whole list. Uh, Jonathan Nicholson, you go. You can go, Jonathan. You should be open now. Momentarily. You want to try the IP part, uh, John? See if that works any better. Let me open it up. Jonathan. We can, I think we can hear you now, Jonathan. Yeah, no, we can. It, it's it's all. It, when is will it be ready to deploy in terms of years? Uh, depends. If you're talking UHF, it's now. I mean, people are using it. We 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 have customers have been deploying it in production for three and a half years now. Uh, yeah. 
and and true we are the most remote area tends to be a really good place uh so the the simply because oh there you go jonathan it's yours can you hear me now yes we can go ahead fantastic all right great so yeah just to add thank you very much for for uh for all the information there and uh if anybody has any questions or any needs or concerns you know we're here to help we have our uh our design uh, services available. We work very closely with Redline, as you may already see here from this uh, presentation today. And uh, we also provide support as well. So if there's any questions that you have, whether it's on the database or the equipment or what components are needed or pricing or anything like that, just uh, shoot us an email or give us a call. Uh, we're available at uh, sales at ispsupplies.com or you can just give us a shout at 855-947-7776 uh, and speak to any of our uh, friendly sales associates here. So the uh... I, I want to go through some of the questions. Uh, let me see. And I, hopefully I'm not missing anything. Just uh, raise your hand through the chat I, if I'm missing anything. Go ahead, John. Can I, ask, can I ask a question? Is anybody hearing me? Oh, absolutely. Go ahead. I'm uh, sorry about that. It's just Jonathan was in, and I thought it would be a good time just to pop him a quick question. Jonathan, this is Randall with HBE. Um, have you guys put a document together maybe that says, you know, step one, step two, step three, step four, that would seem to be an awful good starting place. We're actually uh, working on putting something together, almost kind of like a, like a flow chart per se. So that way to kind of minimize uh, uh, any kind of confusion and kind of make it a little easier to deploy and everything. We're also working on putting together some uh, SKUs that are kind of encompass all the equipment needed under one, that way it's easier for one click type of thing. Because it gets a little confusing, you know, when you're adding the CPE and the license needed and the antennas and so forth. So uh, we're definitely working on uh, simplifying the whole process for everybody. So good things are coming down the line. Okay, so hopefully there will be some kind of um, document that that says, you know, because, I mean, knowing absolutely nothing about all of this, even though we've been a WIS for, you know, 12 years or so, um, you know, so many other times you end up spending energy in one area and it's like, oh, you haven't done that yet. So we, exactly. I, I know our company will be waiting with bated breath to get some kind of email or document from ISP saying, you know, do this, then this, then this. So I'll just leave it at that. Thanks, Jonathan. Oh, you're very welcome. Yes. And we're definitely working with, uh, with Dennis and the whole team over at Redline there to put something together so that, uh, it could uh, kind of simplify everything for everyone and make sure that none of the steps are missed uh, either. So, Not and sure. uh, also check, make sure that you check out the the TV uh, white space uh, guide, the where to begin and best practices. That kind of lays out a little bit of the steps, yeah. but we're gonna be putting the, uh, something else together to kind of cover whatever is not covered in that document. And the uh, I also want to add that so that document, the best practice, we keep evolving it as we go forward. As we as we bring other parts to it, or people ask for something, and if if we get the same question, you know, 20 times over, we'll just end up writing a response to it. Uh, we are also uh, preparing, and I, I'm sorry to say, I wanted to have it this week, but it's not. It's probably going to be two weeks. Uh, literally, uh, how to come up with a bill of material uh, video, uh, because it could be confusing. It's a new product for a lot of people. So between the radios, the the, feed, the personality key, the feature key, the subscription, and what is in the box, what is not. So we actually we've had a lot of question as to what are what parts do I need and what the heck do these parts do for a living. So we're literally going to do a, a video that we'll post, uh, I guess, on YouTube for lack of a better name, but probably in the Facebook group as well. Uh, but yeah, trying to help every way we can to make it simple. Um, so well, let me see, is there any, uh, I see a lot of the questions out being uh, pretty much handled. Denis, that was just a question that I wanted to, to answer. I, oh, yeah. I didn't answer, I only saw it afterwards, was just on, on the Nominate database and when it's available. So I just wanted to clarify, our database is already approved by the FCC and it is available now. So we are already integrated with Redline and the Redline radios. Uh, that is something that is there, and that is a cloud service that essentially, as a user, you will not necessarily directly see. The I showed um, and that I gave a demo of is is a separate um, solution that, that we offer, which is really there as a pre-planning tool and you to check channel availability. But it demonstrates really what what the role of the 
does. So that is something that we have available now, but we are launching a new version of that particular um, solution at the end of this month. And and thank you very much, Anna. And further to what Anna just said, uh, so everything is right now certified, but until FCC resumes operation, there's not going to be a certificate. And until then, uh, we so what we're doing is, and when you're, how you're going to manipulate, not manipulate, but commercially transact the database is, whenever ISP supplies uh, gets inventory, they also get the database uh, components. And we pre-provision everything with Nominet. So by the time you get your radio, you plug it and you light it up, uh, it's going to be on the database itself. So you're not going to have to to create a, 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 a ticket or a widget into the radio. It's going to get taken care of by itself. Um, hopefully that answers part of the question. Uh, we could probably right do. I'll, I'll I'll come up with a bit of a schematic in terms of of uh, from a, from an IP perspective transactionally how it's done between the token exchange um, to help visualize how it's done. But commercially speaking. When you buy the radio, you buy the subscription, you're, you're good. It's, it's done. Um, Adam Sumbler, uh, Canada is a different place. Every country has different rule. Uh, Canada has the same type of rule as the U.S., but sadly, they did not pick uh, Nominat as a database. Uh, when they had, and, and, uh, and the database they have chosen does not support some of the, the standards for uh, interaction. Hence, I don't know of any vendor that actually Certified to Canada, you could still get experimental license. Uh, you could uh, you could reach out to me offline or on the Facebook place, um, and I'll I'll expand if that's needed. Quick question to Hannah: Are we able to are we able to to sign up for the database so we can start looking our areas over? Uh, yes, if, if there is anything that you would like to check um, in the meantime, I would suggest just dropping me a mail. In terms of access yourself, I have been told that the latest version will be available in two weeks. Um, so if there is something you want to check before, uh, please just drop me a mail and I can check it on, on our demoware um, for you. Okay, and where is your contact information located? I did just send it on the on the group, but I, uh, on the message, but I can send it again. And if not, I will ask uh, the guys, ISP supplies or Redline, to share my contact information as well. Uh, this is Randall. I got a question uh, for Carl. Carl's wanting to know how much this stuff costs. It's pretty expensive. Can you guys speak to the uh, some sort of a grant or something like that? Not sure I follow you. Are there grant options for some of this red line gear or for the air band stuff? This is Randall. Grants. No, no, not that. Well, outside of funding that you would get from state, local, or anything else. No, not that I know of. Or I completely misunderstand the question. Maybe you want to rephrase the question, or Randall. And uh, uh, Brad, to Brad Gass, uh, I, if that's okay with you, I'll reply openly. Uh, those who already have radios, those who were bought radios a couple of years ago, or or uh, back in the days of Spectrum Bridge, as the FCC resumes operation, uh, we're going to release version 3.8 and change of the code that that does all of these wonderful things with Nominet. And uh, those who had previous uh, radio, so if you bought radio last year or something like that, uh, same thing. There'll be a software upgrade to to uh, to connect to the Nominet, but you will also have to uh, all of, pay the fee. There's no, it, there's nothing to grandfather existing customer. Uh, so the the model of fee is different from Spectrum Bridge to Nominet, but I but. But as you saw, the value is completely different too. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, and, and uh, one, go ahead. One one quick question. I'm assuming because we're probably going to wait. I'll I'll get with Anna on some or Hannah on some emails. Uh, but everything is available, equipment wise. 
when we want to move forward other than the uh, FCC and and uh, Donald having fun times, right? Correct. The inventory is okay. on the shelf. You are allowed to go in production today. It's not an issue. The only thing that we cannot do today until we have uh, the FCC paperwork done is give you release 3.8 and because we're overly concerned. Well, my personal opinion, because we're overly conservative. Uh, the way the FCC does certification is really external engineering house, certify, then upload files to the FCC. But until all of this is visible to save conflicts with competition or complain, we're just not going to do anything. Uh, so what we'll grant you is is uh, you get a temporary key that opens up the radio so you get to work without it. And you're still your subscription is still covered when you bought the radio, you paid for a subscription. You're still registered, uh, but you're going to get to the database as soon as FCC resumes. So you are. We have about 500 radios in production today. There are ISPs that are rolling out systems today in production uh, in a number of areas. Can you talk about the specs a little bit as far as range and capability? Nah, I, I'd. Uh, well, so if again, if you're in, in the middle of nowhere where there's no tree, uh, I, I, I'll give you bits per hertz. That's, you know, if, if that works for everybody. So the the, the radio uh, at Quam 256, 7 over 8, will support uh, 9.3 bits per hertz. will support 6.5 bits per hertz at Quam 64 and down to 4.5 at Quam 16. Uh, so what that means is on, on a, if you have... A, Four TV channel bonded together uh, that you get about 160 meg at uh, it, at Quam 256, and you get about 120 at Quam 64, and down to about uh, and, a, and so on as you can imagine. So you go from 160, 120, give or take 80, 70, and then about 40. So if you only have one TV channel, uh, you can get now. We'll you know, typically we see Quam 256 quite often on the download. And we see Quam 16 and 64 uh, mostly on the upload for the most part. But again, all of this ties to the noise level. We have seen places where one polarization can get you neg 60 noise, which makes it completely unusable. Uh, so you'll go with two antennas of the same polarity to, to still get MIMO gain. So performance vary greatly. Uh, if you talk install customers, those who have been in customers for years, They'll tell you that on a six meg channel, they can serve uh, 15 meg customers day in, day out. They'll do about 15 to 25 on a sector. If they can bond two to three channel, then there's no problem dealing with a 25 meg uh, download from the FCC. They're doing this uh, constantly. So I hope it helps. But again, it's, it's not line of sight. So um, it depends widely on the noise level and, and how deep in the absence of uh, line of sight you are um, the radio specs the radio has is it actually has a linear amplifier so when you read power rating it's actually at quantum 256 the uhf radio carries the same tx power regardless of the modulation it's a very linear amplifier um, we probably have the best mimo a uh, where we can do MRRC uh, on the receive and STBC on the transmit. So we're seeing MIMO gains anywhere from the magnitude of literally 7 to 10 dB of, of MIMO gain. So that makes a big, big difference in, in the performance. Um, does that answer some of the question? I, I, uh, I don't want to talk too much nuts and bolts. Uh, well, so Tim Shaw, I just saw your question. The, uh, yeah, um, I mean, nothing goes through dirt, as you can imagine. Now you have the physics of, of diffraction, refraction that can play a role if you have, especially if you're in the rocky type area or if you have hard, uh, or hard ground. But, uh, you know, it, it's still 600 megahertz is not that much. Of, oh, there you go. Some guidance. 600 megahertz is not that much less than 900 and most of you probably know 900 in 900 you're typically trying to get a couple of meg service in uhf what you may try to get is probably more like 15 if you're not in funded types area or 25 if you're in funded area 
So while 600 will propagate better than 900, you're not going to reach much further because you'll want to keep much higher length budget. So think of about 900 in terms of reach and, and think that where you're reaching in 900 and have, are getting, you're starting to get unstable length. Uh, out of experience, if you have a proper noise level, we've installed next to unstable 900 and we were getting 17, 18, 20 meg. So it, 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 think of 900 in terms of propagation and reach. Uh, there is no magic. Uh, sadly, um, you're not going to go 20 miles and on line of sight. It's, it's not going to happen. Um, if we had more power, of course, but you know, and antenna gains, just like for 900, antenna gains are, are quite limited. Uh, I've not seen more than 11 dBi of gain so far. Uh, so you, you, you're really counting on the TX power on a MIMO, uh, benefit because you can't, you can't really make it with antenna gain all that much. That's all. Yeah. So from what, from what I'm reading, uh, to, to get this, okayed with the FCC, everybody involved, we are going to have to offer a minimum of a 25 meg download package. Is that correct? No, the, the, the minimum that the 25 meg is really if uh, FCC says if this is what broadband is. So you're going to see CAF2, okay. right? Like the CAF2 program imposes that you deliver 25 meg. Uh, we're going to see, you're going to see more and more funding organization, funding bodies, whether it's counties or state. Uh, there, a lot of them uh, are going to rely on the FCC rule for for defining the minimum service rate. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, if you want to, if you have a fund, so and and well, I don't want to go into the whole engineering of funding, but the reality is, you in, in funding, you do what you have to do to provide this 25 meg service. The reality is, you may just sell a 10 meg service or a 15 meg service. So this is there's a there's a nuance between what you're billed to and, and commercially what you sell. Uh, those, those who've uh, played with funding probably know that part quite well. Right. So if I'm not getting funding, I can sell a five meg or a 10 meg oh, package. Yeah. Darn right. Yes, absolutely. The, okay. uh, Thank you. And we've not modeled this too often, to be honest with you. When we, whenever we model and uh, actually the, the, let me bring up the, uh, this part here. Whenever we model, we model around uh, Quam 16. Uh, we usually stop right about Qualm 16 for a, for a couple of reasons. It's it's where you're going to get to your your 15 plus meg service. Um, the guidance for those of you who use uh, planning software. So the guidance also has proper assumption for radio mobile for EDX. Uh, we are working with one of your peer to 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 deliver assumptions for Atoll. Um, and as we go along, as we build more assumption. Uh, we can add, we're, we're happy to share that. So this is, uh, if so this is, if you're using EDX, these are the kind of assumptions you have to build in to get the proper coverage. So, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to, as we're collecting information, um, folks from antenna manufacturers are also going to be contributing soon enough because it's important that everybody, uh, gets access to the, to the information. Is that probably, and I'm going to try, you know, just there, there's still a, still a hundred person on the call. So let me try to uh, do something silly here and, and unmute everything uh, for a second, because I'm sure there might be people who just rather ask a question than. Uh... That might be. So guys, if you have any questions, go ahead. Uh, yeah, feel free. Yes, we will have copies of the presentation. I see supplies. I'm gonna uh, are gonna use this. The uh, in, I'm gonna have to, to mute everybody. Yeah, that didn't work out that well. Let me. Sorry. Let me go back to muting everybody. And three, for 360 degree coverage. Now keep in mind the uh, kind of like 900. Uh, I can't remember who asked that question, but somebody did. The uh, the reality is you're going to use this band a lot for fill for fill and and spot coverage. You're not going to go out and uh, and build. Well, I mean you can, but it, geography is always different. But the you're not typically going to go out and build full 360 degree coverage because you you may not have non line of sight customers in full 360 degree. Here, here's here's my reasoning. 
Um, say, for instance, you're in the Appalachian. Well, there's not too many people built up on top of the mountains, but it's people, the, the communities, the village, they seem to follow the bottom of the valley. So you may not need, you may need to go at one end of the, of the community and, and shoot down the valley. So we're seeing a lot of, uh, uh, Mark Brown, I guess the folks at ISP supplies could absolutely, uh, absolutely answer that question. The, um, so typically we, we see, we, antennas are big, 90 degree sector, about five feet tall. Uh, what, and, and since you're trying to do non line of sight, you're not trying to go 10, 15, 20 miles. It, it's going to be closer than this. You're going to hit anywhere from, from zero to five, six miles, maybe more, but I, I'm trying to be conservative here. So five, six miles, if you're looking at your antenna, how they're qualified for 90 or 60, that's, it's that plus, minus, plus or minus three dB. So if you take a 90 degree in the first three, three, four miles, that probably acts closer to a 120, if not a 180. So you need to, to think about that when you're setting it up. If you're doing, if you're looking for 360 coverage, honestly, I would go no more than 390. I may actually do. And depending on how far I'm trying to reach, I uh, may try to get shorter than this. A lot of people have used Yagi for sector or flat panel because the typical Yagi flat panel, uh, two feet, 11 dBi, that's going to give you about 55 degrees. Uh, so if you're in the first few miles, that's almost like a 90 degree. So the, the antenna strategy you'll need to pay attention to and, and, and really consider, uh, based on the network design. I'm sorry that was a lengthy part, but you know, it's, it's one of the common expectations and one of the common questions. The, the, uh, actually, I don't have, uh, no, uh, email address, Mr. Uh, from, uh, gentleman from, well, lady or gentleman from Farmtel. I don't have email address from, uh, from, uh, from the, from the attendees. Sorry. Uh, I don't have that. The system, we don't ask, we don't impose for people to put their email address. Uh, we're trying to make this as open as possible, but feel free. Um, if uh, feel free to drop an email to ISP supplies or to drop us an email. If you go back into the communication threads in the early threads, you had, uh, you have my email address. I'm Dennis. You also had that of Chris, uh, at Chris at red light. So feel free. And yeah, copy will all be, uh, well, there you go. Jonathan answered that one. Sean, thank you. Welcome. So if, is there a, feel free, there's still time. And, and if there's, there's still, you know, 90 person on the call. So you guys, uh, you guys are great. Uh, I have no other. I would like to, uh, to actually say something. Uh, not that I, as if I've not talked so far. The, uh, those of you who follow the, uh, the Patrick's page, the Facebook, uh, unofficial user group, I think it's called. Um, we've, I've not been extremely present. I'm, I'm extremely social media challenged. Um, and, uh, so the, the, I originally logged in as Peter Dennis. If somebody would try to, that was me. That was my, it's my first name. Um, I did that so my friends don't all hate me for not accepting their friendship request. Uh, and, and for odd reason, I cannot log into this account anymore. I did create a second account under Dennis Lambert and, uh, now Facebook is telling me that they're waiting to confirm my identity. So I'm, I'm not responsive probably. And, and with my skills, that might be a few days. So feel free to reach out. I know Jonathan is extremely present on, on, on the Facebook page. Jonathan uh, Nicholson from, uh, from ISP supplies. Reach out to him. If you're trying to, to, to send me a note or trying to get something from us, reach out to him. Jonathan knows, uh, you know, got, got my email. He knows my phone. Uh, but we, we are absolutely committed to the space. We are absolutely committed to, uh, to the Facebook, to, to perpetuating the Facebook page and, and providing support. Tamara, our inside salesperson, Chris Ward, that's also on this call. Um, and Sergio Cristancho, which is part of the team, uh, the, the virtual team for a service provider are all active and, and we just need to learn to be, uh, better at it but uh, don't don't give up on the website or the, the group uh, it's not about we're not abandoning it i will i will uh mr frontel will send you a presentation
Are there any further questions? We are coming into obviously the hour. Um, I'm okay to keep it open. If you have uh, questions, if there's value, do let me know. Uh, if, or if you want to have a question to Anna or to anyone from ISP Supplies, go right ahead. Thank you, Blake. That's a great idea. Actually, Blake, you know, you can also contact Blake on the Facebook Facebook group if you're trying to reach uh, Dennis Lambert. Because uh, yeah, until uh, until I learn Facebook better. Oh, uh, it's a private group, uh, Jason. It's it's called uh, Red Line. Uh, Blake, could you be able to to put the Facebook group name? I think it's called the Red Line User Group. Um, so you just apply to join and then we're going to do this is there there you go that's a good question destry no idea um that was a uh, it was actually an interesting question before that one vhf so no it's strictly uhf no vhf uh, support the radio supports the band actually in the us goes from 470 to uh Currently, the 693, I believe, or 690, roughly. Uh, the radio supports that part. We are changing the radio range uh, in the next build because, obviously, as you know, the upper part has been sold off to uh, to, to to auction. So the uh, the space for TV white space or the the TV white space um, area of the spectrum is going to be restricted to give or take 470 to 6. 15, 614. So we're gonna have we have full support for everything that's in the TV white space uh, bands allocation, but there's no support for VHF. Sorry. Where is Randall? Uh, not sure. We, uh, well, yeah, yeah, Sean, uh, yes, it has been used uh, for uh, for SCADA, um, the, not necessarily in this band. So, but the platform, the the RDL three thousand, absolutely. That's actually one of the reason why. The platform, including the UHF version, but the platform supports channelization down to 875 kilohertz uh, because a lot we've done a lot in in um, uh, water utilities, mining, oil and gas in terms of replacing conventional SCADA for having IP type services uh, and delivering, you know, sometimes as, as silly as delivering half a meg. But yes, a lot of the uh, a lot of the SCADA and a lot of like, of, the, of that industry requires a bi-directional traffic and uh, it has been one of our extremely uh, solid market for a number of years in in anywhere so the platform treat that's used for uhf carries the same feature and i could probably put that slide back actually it carries the same feature for uh, in uhf as well as uh, let me go let me put that slide back here as well as in as well as in the 2.0 to 2.3 band, which in the U.S. ties into the uh, the BAS band, the Broadcast Auxiliary Services, and at, two, at 2185. It also supports the uh, Department of Justice 2200 to 2290 uh, unlimited cap. That radio specifically is actually a one watt radio. It's a bit different. We support the two three a radio supporting two three to two seven, which is the ISM band and some of the EBS. Obviously, three three to three eight. Uh, we've had a lot of the in, in the three six five. We probably are not going to use this radio. Well, actually, I don't think we will use this radio for CBRS because we have an LTE platform for CBRS and of course the four nine. So they all share the same exact feature, uh, and the channelization goes all the way down to eight hundred seventy five kilohertz. So hopefully, Sean, that answers your question. But yes, we've used this a lot for uh, SCADA and uh, Smart City. Actually, we've got a couple of interesting case study, I think, on the website about that. So, Sean, uh, if uh, if feel free, reach out to Chris. Reach out to me when you're testing. 
Uh, we, we do want experience to go well the first time around. Uh, we're, we've done a number of, uh, of one-on-one -on -one session, uh, through, uh, one of those PC control system, remote control system to help you with configs and whatnot. Uh, actually that would be Chris, not me. You, you, you don't want to trust me with configuration. So the uh, th that's an interesting question. Yeah, Eric's a good man. Uh, very interesting question from uh, from uh, from CRG. Um, not sure. Uh, so in five gig, I've, those of you who are actually everybody on web could, could look at it, right? So a number of places you get in five gig works out, and then the lease comes in, and what happens with TV white space? How how significant are the change? Uh, they're always significant. There's there's not much to be said. Um, especially when you're going to um, into very leafy area, um, deciduous are not as bad as the uh, as the resinous, but th there will be a lot of absorption by vegetation. Whether we like it or not, the softer the material, the better, the, the more the absor absorptions. Um, is it worth testing in the winter? Well, you know, if you've got if you've got a lot of uh, pine and 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 spruce and fir. Uh, sure, okay, ain't gonna change much from from summer to winter. If you're into uh, to deciduous type uh, forest, I would say plant an extra. You can test, and then you know for the first few. If if you're going through solid first mile, first few miles, I would I would think think of a 10 dB loss that you're gonna get with the uh, with foliage. Um, so what you can test for. In the winter time, actually, in this time of the season, for the most part, is the noise level. So go up 100 feet or or 250 meter uh, HAAT uh, and and listen up to the noise. If you clear the treetops, the noise is going to be the same above the tree lines anyway. And find out if your noise level is at at you know neg 80 or less, then you have a business. Um, so you have to you can already validate those things. But yes, that will impact. Um, there's still uh, 70 people on the line, so I, I'm I'm hesitant about unmuting everyone, and, and I um, so so feel free to just drop a question or or just ask for the mic. I could probably open it up on a one by one. Sometimes a conversation is easier than than just a chat. Personally, I got paid. Right. And the $275 is the part of the alienation five years ago, my man. Well, guys, if uh, if there are no more questions, um, let's see. Hi, um, this is this is uh, Jason Weaver. Um, did you guys talk about whether the bands had to be contiguous or they were non-contiguous? Oh yeah, you, uh, so uh, the it's bonding. So bonding means contiguous channel as opposed to aggregates. So our uh, in TV white space we were dealing with uh, contiguous channel, so basically side by side channels. And uh, in in CBRS, we're using uh, we could use aggregate channel, which are non-contiguous. So that might actually be uh, some some of the confusion when you're talking red line because the two platforms behave differently. Gotcha. Is there is there any plans for aggregation in the in the TV white space products? Um, I think not on this platform. I think within the next two years, what you're going to see, even in the TV white space, is is likely going to be more of the more of the uh, LTE type platform. Um, right now, you wouldn't be able to count on that because the uh, the FCC rules pretty much bars LTE type technologies. But uh, not really. And actually, the reality from testing that we're seeing is that we're trying. What we're trying to do right now is to pack the same capacity on a single three channel, because the the um, the challenge, and I know that I've, obviously there's other vendors that are, that are presenting different idea. There's two parts to the aggregation and channel bonding. Uh, one is 
getting four, five, or ten channels might be interesting, but you have the same power to deal with from a radio perspective, and you're dealing with non-line of sight. So the wider channel that you have, the more your the more energy dispersion you have, or the less power density you have. And the objective is still to punch through and deliver services. So what we've seen in a number of plays is that four channels, yeah, it, it could work, but we're getting better capacity with three channels simply because we, we carry more energy density through the obstruction. So that, that would be the first part. The second part, to have a, a carrier aggregation, multiple non-contiguous channel, really implies that from a Mac, from a radio perspective, you need to have multiple Mac to deal with the different channels. And uh, and uh, as, uh, as my friend from Six Harmonics always repeat, no problem, it can be done, but nobody will pay for it. So right, it's yeah. it's one of those things, right? So I think our, if our, and we've had a lot, you know, we've got four years of experience with this one. Um, what we're working for is to have even tighter channel in the radio specs so we can keep delivering the same 160 meg, but on only three TV channels. So just maximizing the power density, uh, because that's always the thing that, that hits you in behind. Right, right. Thank you. No, that's my pleasure. And uh, are CP going to be compatible with new generation of AP, uh, Caleb? Um, uh, let me see. Let me see where you are. Let me give you, let me unmute you just so you can. Uh, Further explain this. Um, Caleb Web, Caleb. Go ahead, Caleb. You're just not. You're not muted. You can. Uh, so, what's the question exactly? Oh, oh, you don't have a mic. Sorry, my friend. Um, so, I guess the question may come from: uh, Have you bought radios from? Uh, let's see. Uh, if they're XP base radio, so if if. Uh, there are the L3000 XP base. There's no issue from compatibility. If they're not XP base, uh, compatibility is limited to release 2.28 of the code. So I believe that, and I'm just jogging my memory here, drop me an email or actually reach out to, to, to Chris. I believe that we have never made a UHF before release three. So, so they're all XP base. So yeah, there should be no issue. We haven't seen issues so far anyway. The new CP, uh, if you're probably talking about the new AP. So the, the AP, and maybe that to refine this uh, this answer, I was mentioning that we're going to reduce the, the the frequency range. That's going to be only on the CPE. The base station is going to remain. We're not going to have a base station just for the US and one for the world. Uh, it's always going to be full range, so 470 to 690. But from a CPE perspective, we're going to, those that are going to be applied only to the FCC, the U.S. market, are going to be uh, limited to 470 to 6, six and change, uh, the bands that have not been optioned off. And yes, all of this will be uh, compatible. Yeah, you should, uh, Jim, look at that, getting set up uh, with the Airband initiative. You go to, you Google Microsoft Airband and on the, on the top, there's a button that says ISP program. It's about that complicated to, to register. CP setup, uh, J Jonathan, you need uh, one each REM unlimited. And uh, no, uh, wrong, uh, wrong uh, subscription, uh, Jonathan. So the subscription, let me uh, correct that. So there's three types of subscription. So for a CPE, for, on the Airband program, because that BS part that's over there, it's, I, I hate the name BS, but that uh, that server white space database BS-1-year-E1, that is for a base station under the Airband program. If you are looking for a subscription under the Airband program, for white space database for CPE, the part number will be CPE dash one year dash E1. There you go. That would be the part number for the CPE. And if it's not uh, on an airband program, uh, the part number to be used would be serve dash white space database.
Thanks, Caleb. And typically on your bill of materials, you're going to see, so the radio is MIMO, so obviously you need uh, two antenna, whether it's a dual pole antenna or it's two separate antenna. Uh, you're going to see that in, in uh, everybody wants a panel, everybody wants a small panel. Um, I think there's a bunch of vendors out there that are building up very nicely. You're going to see a lot of those panels being about in the 7 to 8 dB uh, of gain, probably just shy of a foot by a foot. Um, I know that one of the antenna vendor as a dual pole Yagi, the same kind of power range, seven to eight kind of um, works reasonably nicely. Actually, the, the bracket is interesting because you can rotate it a bit so you could be off angle uh, to deal with some some noise. Um, but you will also need uh, 11 dBi gain uh, in the number for, for uh, the less fortunate install. And you will likely use uh, at some time, uh, single pole antennas because uh, TV broadcasters operate typically on the horizontal band, or not band but polarity, and uh, and you're going to see a lot of places where your V pole is 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 reasonably clean, but your H pole is completely destroyed, and you have two options at that point: either you run in SISO mode with a single antenna on on the V, or you run MIMO. We put two antennas on V and offset them a bit. Uh, either in azimuth or elevation, and then still get uh, MIMO gain from from uncorrelated signal. Uh, so the uh, you will have different types of antennas in your uh, in your pocket well, truck. And uh, and and Jonathan uh, and Blake, as soon as we do this uh, bill of material video, uh, we'll send it. Out, I'll send it out to you. Because I think it's going to be uh, interesting for all the people, to everybody. We we don't always have the opportunity to see what's all in the box and whatnot. So, folks, I have uh, I have a bit of a hard stop uh, momentarily. Um, there's still 60 people on the line. Um, thank you, <laughs> thank you so much, um, folks from ISP Supplies. Thank you immensely for setting it up. Uh, Anna, I know how it's how late it is now uh, home. So thank you very much. Uh, have a have a good night's sleep. The recording, uh, I will uh, I will I will probably call you Blake because I suspect it's going to be bigger than an email. So we'll figure out a way to to get it up to you, uh, as well as the presentation. So on this, I will uh, turn off the the session. Um, mute you all for one unmute you all for one last time. But thank you so much, guys. Uh, I hope you have a great afternoon. We're almost to the weekend. So you still have time to place your order and maybe get deliveries.